Channing Allen, welcome to the 15 Minute Founder. If you can't tell, we're going to learn everything about you in 15 minutes. I like to think of it as a, it's a video resume of sorts. Here we and go. we're going to jump right in. No fluff, hot hitting questions, learning about your story. And I need to start with a quick bio, but then I'm going to pass it over to you. You founded a company called Indie Hackers, which helps share stories, business ideas, strategies, and revenue numbers from the founders of profitable online businesses. It was then acquired by Stripe. And then now it spun out and in true indie hacker roots or indie hacker business style, back running the business. So there we go. We're indie again. <laughs> indie again. Yeah. I want to go piece by piece here. Yeah. What is an indie hacker? And after we define that, I want to hear how you started the business, Dave. Maybe the, the biggest or the smallest elevator pitch is you have big tech. And that's, you know, a founder of a tech company who wants to become the next Elon Musk or the next Mark Zuckerberg, wants to create a monopoly and disrupt things and, and build a unicorn. Indie hackers are the little business or the little tech of the tech startup world. And there are many orders of magnitude more of them than the big tech founders. And they just didn't really get a lot of press or attention because they're not changing big things. They're, they're doing things that people consider to be pet projects and, and that kind of thing. Uh, but we kind of got going with Indie Hackers by noticing it, being like, no, these people are the shit. You know, someone in their bedroom in their pajamas making $50,000 a month isn't going to get on TechCrunch, but they got on Indie Hackers. And, and so that's a nutshell of what they are. How do you start that from scratch? Like idea makes sense. Indie hacker, these pet projects, I get it. It's most of the world too. But how do you get that to something which is getting thousands of people visiting it per day? Was there a secret or a growth hack you did? There's no secret. There's no growth hack. What it is, is it's just something that people were starving for and didn't know that they wanted. And we ourselves didn't know that it was something that was so that was going to be so hot. I mean, it was the, the first story we ever published of someone who was an indie hacker blew up. The second story blew up. The third story blew up. And uh, I mean, even even the origin story is my co-founder and brother was looking for a startup to start. And so what did he do? He scoured the internet and, and forums for people who weren't trying to become unicorn founders and were just sharing their revenue and sharing their secrets on online. And that seems to be kind of a, a filtering function where if you're trying to become the next so-and-so, you tend to be way more likely to uh, to be on stealth mode, to not want to share things, to not want to take people into the back offices. And if you are a little guy who doesn't have a lot of funding, you don't have a huge budget for marketing. So one of the things that you can do to market is just like to kind of show up naked in front of the world and say, hey, here's how I came up with my idea. Here's my tech stack. Here's my, here are all my secrets. That's catnip. And so my brother noticed, he was like, well, I'm looking for ideas. And I noticed that every one of these stories of an indie hacker who shares everything transparently, those stories always go viral. So why don't I just create a place that is just the, the, the media company for these people? That seems in theory like it should go viral too. This is one of those situations where theory met practice. Theory met practice and then next thing you know, you got acquired by Stripe. Like six months later. Wild. Can you yeah. tell me how that went down? Can you? Can, right. I wish I want to be a fly in the wall there. How did right. you get acquired by Stripe? So I think there are three kinds of acquisitions that are pretty common. One of them is just revenue-based acquisition. You have a small company that's making a lot of money. The big acquiring company wants to merge streams. Sometimes and especially in Silicon Valley, big companies want to kill off their competition. And then you have this sort of miasmic, hard to place version of an acquisition, which is just strategic. And that's what we are. Strategic is just like, there's something about the acquiring company's objectives or the ways that they want to get to their objectives. And they notice that some other company is doing something where we should acquire them and pour fuel on that fire and, and it'll help us to get to our objectives. In the case of Stripe, Stripe is like Silicon Valley's darling. Tech companies love them. You know, engineers, software engineers love them. They don't really need to convince people who, who are running companies to use Stripe. For them to grow, for Stripe to grow, they need to just make more people who are not entrepreneurs become entrepreneurs. And that's simple, but it's not at all easy. And so as they were thinking about initiatives and maybe creating new teams or magazines internally at Stripe to do that, which is how do you even playbook for that? That was right when we were coming on the scene. And so uh, Patrick Collison, the CEO of Stripe, was also a big fan of our, of, of our stories. He noticed that we were like making these little guys famous. Uh, we were like inspiring so many people who were nine to five developers at Google or whatever, see us and go, why can't I do that, right? I, I can do a side project on the side. I can, you know, these little projects that don't have any funding, like that's not anything that's special or beyond my technical capabilities. And so we were doing exactly what Stripe wanted us to do. And so I think they decided, hey, let's 
shower these guys with money, make sure that they don't like, you know, mess up their, like we, we were thinking all, of all sorts of things that probably would have limited our reach because we wanted to turn that into revenue. And Stripe was like, no, let's just acquire you and just grow as big as possible and have as big of an impact as possible. So that's, that's it in a nutshell. I want to fast forward a bit now. So now you mentioned you're back to your true indie roots, right. spun out from Stripe. And you mentioned before, y'all are building this media company or the place for all of these stories to go viral. And that attracts more people who want to be like that. I can see a network effect there. Right. Can you just walk through what does it mean to be a media company? And just so folks can understand, like, how do you build a business around that too? Like, What type of revenue streams are there? How do you actually monetize and make revenue here? There's the simple and kind of boring answer. And then there's the slightly more interesting part of that answer that touches on our unique advantage as a media company. Media companies are old hat. It's really kind of basic. Um, you have some kind of content play where you give people something that you, you you write stuff, you inform people, you inspire people, you entertain people with content, and you need that to be good enough for them to subscribe. If you have a subscription model, we ha we have that, and then we also have the in a sense like the the top of the funnel way that we make money with that, which is that we have a newsletter. I think we're up up to maybe one hundred and ten thousand subscribers or so, and we just sell ads against that. So. Whenever you have a subscription product, obviously it needs to be like really, really high quality. And so we're trying to, to do that. Now, the slightly more interesting answer, and j just to be clear, what kind of content are we writing? We're doing those interviews. We're like, you know, sort of finding these indie hackers. We're telling their stories transparently. We are, in a sense, targeting the first few like steps in the developmental stage of creating a company. So we have a starting up page, right? So if you're someone who wants to come up with an idea for a company, we have a massive database of maybe literally two to 300 different companies that are very successful. And we have playbooks on what they did to get their ideas, what they did to find co-founders, what they did to, you know, find their first customers, et cetera. Like we have these, these reports and, and analyses and, for every other problem like or challenge that you have in the very beginning of running a, a business, we have some sort of a content solution for that. The really cool thing about us, given the fact that we don't have a lot of funding, media companies are famously really, really difficult to monetize because you have to spend a lot of money on a huge newsroom and all that stuff, is we co-create a lot of our content with the readers who read our content because our readers are what? Our readers are founders, they're entrepreneurs, they're people who tend to want to get into content marketing just to market themselves. So it's really easy for us to form partnerships. It's really easy for us to find guest contributors who want a the promotion and the, the signal boost that we can give. We have a pretty good brand. So they, they like to see their names listed under our little contributors tab. And then on our side, obviously, we get quote, free content, right? Because we're it's a there's a co creation process. And so I would say 50% of the content that we write, and then publish and monetize is literally written by the community that is is reading that content. What would you say is the the grand mission or goal here? A yeah, media company you want to reach a lot of people, but like what keeps you up in a good way or like keeps you going like hey, I, if I can achieve this outcome, I'll be happy. Yeah, I mean, if you take the, you know, if you time slice right when we got going, we weren't the people who invented this coalition or, or this um, subset of startup founders, they existed already. But one thing that was a bit of our claim to fame in the very beginning was that we put them on the map. We were the first sort of media company to be like, this is cool. This isn't like a fun individual. You know, there's some influencers who kind of have their own brand. Like this is a, a thing. This is a path that you can take that's very legitimate and very cool. Our broader mission, our vision is to make this like the de facto way to become a startup founder, right? It doesn't have to be, you know, what's the shark tank? It doesn't have to be this, this big sensational thing because the, the mainstream narrative for becoming a, start, a startup founder is highly exclusive. There are certain people who don't have the skills for it. If I'm being honest, there, there are a lot of people who really aren't even cut out for it because that's a really, really difficult thing. And some people just don't have the backgrounds or the skills, but almost everyone, has the background or skill to take something that 
they can serve to a community or to a, a set of uh, uh, customers better than other people can. And so we want to massively increase the amount of people who know about that vision and feel like that's an option. Very cool. I actually want to ask you about this. Some people might not be cut out for it or don't fully know what it takes to be an entrepreneur. Right. I, I actually want to read something I saw you wrote in the past. Don't become an entrepreneur because you want freedom. There is no freedom as long as there are problems to solve. Become an entrepreneur because you want to choose and control your unfreedoms rather than having them imposed on you by society. Totally. Can you tell me what that means? I think I, I wrote that and that might have been on Twitter. And I think a lot of people were like, amen. And then a few people were like, what did you just say? And I think that at the core of that is a grand delusion that I have the privilege of being able to see past because I just talk to a lot of people who go from zero to hero. So I see a lot of people who achieve their dreams, who have this startup vision and they, they want to be successful. Some of them come from really tough backgrounds and then they get to that finish line. And what most people think of when they think of the finish line is just rainbows and unicorns and like my ties on the beach. And if that's what they reach for when they get to the finish line, they just become alcoholics and depressed, right? And I think that part of that and a really big part of that insight for me is there is no real finish line, right? Life is a mountain and you think that you get to the summit, but there are literally only ever false summits. And if you just have that perspective, if you know that going in, that reframing is really useful. It doesn't mean you shouldn't reach for the goal. It just means that you just recognize that it's horizontal. It's like you're going to get to the horizon in order to have a new set of talents and skills so that you can get to the next horizon. So there's no freedom, right? There's no, there's no happily ever after. There's just a greater amount of agency because now, now you're still working, but you're not working because your boss is telling you to work. And you're not doing what your boss is telling you to do, but you're still figuring out what to do yourself. So you, you increase your agency, but that's just so that you can choose where you're going to be, you know, where you're going to be working, where, what the effort is going to be channeled into. I love that analogy and this idea of the summit goes away. So then what's the point? The point is, I guess you start to enjoy climbing mountains. Right. You get better at climbing mountains, which you might not have liked at first, but then you, just like it's a, it's a flywheel that spins and you keep climbing. You get right. addicted to the climb. Exactly. Even if there's not a Mai Tai there, or there's a Mai Tai at the end. Yeah, yeah, exactly. You seem very driven. Started the business. It's spun out now. Not raising funds, so you're going this true indie, indie route too. Grand ambitions too. I want to ask you what truly motivates or drives you. And to give a framework, it's said that at any moment in time, there's usually four main forces that can drive or motivate you. Money, power, pleasure, or fame. For the chanting of today, what would you say is the biggest driver? I've seen this, I've seen this question framed before. And it always, it always slightly irks me because I'm like, what it does is it makes the assumption that what you're going for is something static instead of something dynamic. So these are all things that you can acquire and then you just have them. And so to, to not be uh, overly complicated, power of all of those things. But I think that the way that I see it is really similar to what I just mentioned with this, this sort of uh, horizontal everything is a false summit. So you get to that summit in order to climb to the next summit. You get to that summit so that you have greater range of vision and you can figure out where you're going to go next. And I think that fundamental to that climb, to that pilgrimage basically, is power. Because if you, you know, it's all well and good to be like, well, I would like to, to have this dynamic path as well. But if you don't have power, in other words, if you don't have skills, if you don't have like the leverage of a, of a network, um, if you don't have experience and like the scars that help to show you where you shouldn't step as opposed to where you should step, it's not really all that useful, right? And so I think uh, I highly recommend almost every book by this uh, philosopher named Ken Wilber. And he has a phrase that I, that I really would say is what drives me, which is the dialectic of progress. And the di any kind of a dialectic is basically just an argument. And it's an argument that you're having with reality. If you're trying to build a business, then you're basically having an argument against bankruptcy and against people not liking your product, right? And you have to wrestle with that and solve the problems. And then that turns you into a new person. That turns you into someone who's sitting on a business that works. It turns you into someone who knows how you did that and maybe how you could copy that playbook. You can advise people. You can teach people. So I would say power, but power is really just a means to an end of increasing your agency and being able to have a bigger impact. That resonates as you were describing this concept of you reach a summit and then it's kind of like now you can reach other summits. A lot of people talk about like, what's your five-year plan or 10-year plan? Mm -hmm. Sometimes I think like, 
I don't know what my one-year plan is because if I reach these next goals or summits, I'll see summits I didn't know existed at that vantage point. And if I make a five-year plan, I'm limited by my scope of view where I'm looking up here, but then you don't realize these other valleys or mountains too. So I love that cycle of, it's, hey, it's just progress, progress, progress. I want to zoom way back now. Do you think you can be born an entrepreneur? And I guess what I want to ask is like, when you were growing up, did you and your brother say, we're going to start a company together? Was, was that the plan from the get-go? And what's it like working with your brother as a co-founder too? We weren't born as entrepreneurs. We were raised as entrepreneurs. So uh, my mom was, I mean, back in the, the 80s and 90s, ran her own computer business. Computers weren't even really cool or fashionable, and she did that. In a way, we it, there's a, a, a funny backstory that I'm not going to get too far into, but I mean, our, our parents uh, grew up with a bit of a chip on their shoulders. My mom had like a really kind of successful family, and when she married my dad, her family didn't approve of their marriage. So my mom grew up in North Carolina, my dad in Florida, and they were like, okay, well, to hell with it. We're just going to go do our own thing, right? Like my, like some of the grand, my grandparents didn't even show up at the wedding. And so a huge force with us growing up when, when my parents had kids is they were like, we're going to prove that we can do this and that we do belong together and that we're going to be this awesome family. And so like, I think I was maybe two years old when, when our parents were like, okay, we're going to get you on hooked on phonics. We're going to turn you into these excellent kids. And, uh, I've heard a lot of horror stories from a lot of people where they felt like their parents put too much pressure on them. And I feel like Cortland and I, my brother, never, like we were just, like it, it, it never felt like it was too much pressure. I'm really grateful for it now. And that has to be a big part of why we are the way that we are now. Raised as entrepreneurs, did you always want to be an entrepreneur? I think that I always wanted to be good at whatever it was that I did. So no, I, I didn't actually, I mean, I, when I was in, uh, in school, I was like any other kid, but I wanted to be good at what that sort of social circle and that community thought was cool. So I was like a starting point guard on the varsity basketball team. And I couldn't see any further than my nose on that, right? I didn't think about college. I just did that. And then I got to the, the next horizon and I was like, well, what am I going to do now? And Cortland was, a, I think Cortland was a little bit more long range seeing with this. I mean, he lugged around a, a book on Bill Gates at age like 13. And so he, his big thing was, was he was a little bit more nerdy growing up. I was a little bit more jockey and we were like the opposite ends of, of a magnet and that we both probably were really similar in hindsight. We were very similar, but we were so competitive that anything that I kind of edged him out in, he was like, screw that. I don't want to have anything to do with like sports or any of that kind of stuff. And if he, you know, I'm in the, I'm reading five grade levels above my reading level and he's reading six grade levels above. I'm like, nerd, I don't want to read who, who likes books. And then so we became this like exaggerated opposite, polar opposite of each other. And his Coke bottle glasses days, I think he saw Bill Gates and Bill Gates was one of the first really famous nerds who was like on the, the front cover of all these magazines and he made being a nerd cool. So Cortland kind of saw that a little bit further ahead. You, you mentioned something earlier around, hey, maybe not everyone's cut out for entrepreneurship and it's hard. You've now seen though, you've not only created the stories of, hey, this is how someone did it when right. zero to one, but you've probably met a lot of these folks too, some who have made it and there's survivorship bias. Many people don't oh. make it. So I want to ask you for like your hot take question or something that the contrarian question, something that you believe that many others don't believe in. It could be related to entrepreneurship, but just given everything you've seen, like what's something that you just like, hey, this is the way the world is and not everyone sees eye to eye with me, but this is what I think. I mean, I'm literally just going to parrot what you're saying. That is my hot take. I think that it doesn't matter what community you're part of. People form bubbles, and then those bubbles create norms of what's aspirational, what people and other people should be like. And groups and communities just project that. And so I'm part of a community that projects that being an entrepreneur is better than not being an entrepreneur. Everyone can be an entrepreneur. Every dream is attainable. and that's just not true. And I think that one of the reasons why that seems like it's true or why that idea gains so much momentum is because it feels like the empathetic, it feels like the compassionate thing to just make sure that everyone feels like they can achieve any dream. But I actually think, this is maybe my hot take, that it's not compassionate. Because I think, I don't know who the economist was, but there's a, a famous quote that constantly rings true to me, which is that society's a, pa a pack of cards with a bunch of different, what do you call this? The suits, multiple suits. And there's an ace in every single suit. 
And so if you're an entrepreneur and you're in this community, you're like, oh, the ace card is to become an entrepreneur. But then there are other suits that are not you. There are people who maybe they don't want to acquire as much power and agency as possible, and they just want to build communion, and they want to connect with other people. And if you get someone who's more suited to that, and you kind of try to impose this dream on them, then you're gonna, they're going to feel as incongruent with that dream as you would feel if they were like, why are you working so much? Why do you want so much? Why do you, you know, why can't you just, why can't enough be enough? Like, I know what that pull feels like from people who can't relate to me. And so I've learned to not kind of project that onto other people around me. Okay, I want to go a little deeper there. I want to learn a bit more about you and you, you talked about work. So let's actually go there. First, let me actually ask, do you, do you believe in work-life balance? And my follow-up is like, how much do you work building a business? I think it's tricky. There's a friend of mine named Ann Lar has this term because she's probably a very relatable. She runs a community um, that's about a bunch of entrepreneurs or, or it's focused on entrepreneurs and she works a lot. And she's like, well, work-life balance is a concept that makes a lot of sense if you are doing a nine to five. And in a sense, you clearly have this partition between working for someone else, pay for hours, and then having your life where there's no good benefit to you spending extra time laboring for this company when you're not going to get paid. If you're an entrepreneur, it's a little bit different, especially like me, I work from home. So with me, I kind of just see everything as work. Her twist on work-life balance is work-life harmony. You know, I largely to see multiple different arenas that I live inside of. I have a social arena. I have like seven different arenas for indie hackers that are separate from each other, right? I'm, I'm a manager. I have to wear a certain hat. I'm a strategist. I, I run a community, right? So every now and then I'll, I'll go in that sort of social. And a lot of my friends, there's a blurred line between my deal friends and my real friends there so on and so forth. I have a, I have a, a duty to, to maintain my health and fitness and that's work diet. That's work. I even say with, if I'm going to watch a Netflix show, I'd, I'd rather be conscious with it. So I consider that the arena of conscious recreation. I'd rather think about what I want to do and have like soul food with my recreation as opposed to junk food and just find myself mindlessly scrolling TikTok. So to me, it hasn't really been super helpful to create this arbitrary line between work and life that is largely a concept that is kind of ported over from people that just hate their work and feel the Sunday scaries and, and long for vacations. Like my life is a vacation if I'm able to design it in that way. What time do you typically like to wake up in an ideal day? There was a long time where the answer was, was 4.30. I was, I was very Jocko Willink. I was super militaristic about it. Uh, these days, I'm much more open-ended. I won't usually sleep in longer than like 6.30. I don't really drink or party a whole lot these days. So I, I, I rarely have like just the waking up with a hangover situation. It's pretty much 6.30 a.m. I wake up and uh, I have a little bit of a morning routine. I, I do the same thing more or less every day. There's a, a guy named Giovanni Dienstman who wrote a book called Mindful Self-Discipline. And he's like, look, James Clear made habits really popular. And he's like, but one thing you might want to do if you have things like exercise that you want to do every day, or you want to wake up at a certain time, or maybe you want to take a cold shower, or maybe you want to, whatever it is, is just to say that you have never zero commitments. There's just something if you want to be fit, if you want to do a little bit of cardio, if you want to call your mom, make sure you stay in touch with your family. The thing that you have to do is just not do zero of it. So I work out frequently. And a lot of people think like, you know, how do you have the time for that? And the answer is, if I do two pushups, I check that box, and I'm fine with it. Like I'm absolutely, utterly fine. If I get to, you know, if it's 1159, and I'm like, Oh, you know, I haven't worked out, I'll just bang out three pushups, literally, and I'll be fine with it. And then the reality with any of these things is if you do three, you probably are going to be warm enough and sort of in the headspace where you're just going to keep doing them. So that works out. And then I have a couple of those never zero commitments that I want to do with with indie hackers. And that changes all the time. It's not super fixed or rigid. And it starts when I wake up. What are some of your, your other never zeros? I like that concept. Yeah. So I mean, there's the I mean, there's there's resistance training. Um, I think I think mine is is like at this point 20 reps doesn't matter what but I got to get the 20 um, you know five minutes of cardio every day typically I'll just you know parallelize those two things by just doing hit workouts and early in the morning I meditate for five minutes at least every day I have I have one this is kind of meta so this itself is kind of what I would consider this is a character building exercise having a number zero commitment having a morning routine 
these are forms of meta work. I'm not doing work out there in the world. I'm frankly working on myself as the thing that is going to produce results later on. And so even that is one of my never zero commitments. It's to look at my processes and make one small change. Just, just be conscious of it. Always bring online what I'm doing and then think about something that I can fix. And one of the main reasons why I like that one in particular and why I think that it has like it would probably give people outsized gains is I'm a big advocate of habits. I'm a big advocate of morning routines. A lot of people do these things and then there's just this inertia where they'll, it'll bloat and it'll get bigger and you'll ask them six months later, why are you spending three hours doing a cold shower and doing all these different things? And they won't really be able to answer. And it's like mission creep, but it's habit creep. And so I like the idea of just like having a, a, a requirement to just take a look at it, make a little change. Even if it's like, I thought about it, I think everything is, is squeaky clean. And that checks that box off. I, I, I love that analogy you had earlier of the um, the deck of cards in different suites because this concept of like, as you're describing, oh, there's like this arena for Netflix and this arena for gym. Like, yeah, that makes sense. And some people it's going to resonate. I can imagine others like, what the hell, man? Just watch Netflix. <laughs> like, right. Like, right. You, like it work, it's, it's a workout. It's not an arena. Like, I mean, that's an arena action. That's a bad example. But it's like, yeah. why, why does everything have to be so compartmentalized or right. structured? So. For some people, that's going to vibe and resonate. The concept of indie hackers might vibe or resonate. There's probably a segment that's like VC or bust. Why do a what, right. what's the point of like hitting a single? Like we're only here on life. You should swing for not just a home run, but hit a grand slam 15 times with one finger. So I really like that concept of different different decks of cards, and something's going to resonate with different people. Right, exactly. What would you say has been the most impactful? book like i like to call them these earthquake books mm. but you read them and like life wasn't the same after it was like an earthquake that's one of my other never zero commitments is to read for five minutes every day and even bigger than that i i just only two months ago ended a streak of maybe two or three years where i had to read a book every week wow and so it's actually really difficult for me to say what the earth shattering book is typically there's a lot of recency bias in that and so the most recent book that i think is is been kind of earth shattering but of course it's built on all of these layers so i i don't know how i don't know i don't know if this is only my ace card or if it's going to resonate with other people is by the philosopher that i mentioned recently ken wilbur and it's called a theory of everything actually he has he has one that's i think it's called a brief history of everything and then one is a theory of everything and both of them are pretty good and this is a guy that has like this you know a million books and a lot of them are really big and these two books in a lot of ways summarize his ideas and I guess a, a too long didn't read version of a lot of his ideas are that he essentially lays out a vision where everything in life, not even just people, but just the world around us is going through a bunch of developmental stages, is, is evolving. And he, it's, it's kind of theoretical, it's kind of philosophical, but I think these days those are the ones that I like the most because then those, just like I'm reaching for a summit and then I can see more far ranging things, this kind of book helps me to ask different questions and just see things in ways that I that I wouldn't otherwise see them. And it perfectly aligns with one of my big values. I mean, the, that dialectic of progress idea is, at least he's the one that gave me the terminology for that, which is it gives you a vision for something that I would call infinite entrepreneurship. So it gives you it gives you a good framework for thinking about, A, being ambitious and having a goal that's in front of you, but he gives you a framework where you can kind of clearly and, and concretely think about the stages that you want to keep going through. Because I think a lot of people are very, um, they have a bit of a dichotomy where they're just like, you know, if I don't have some ultimate goal that I can name and quantify and say, this is going to happen in 10 years from now, then I don't really feel a lot of motivation. And I think that with him, he, he'll give you a, a, a way to think about developmental stages above you that infinitely go upward. So. That's probably the the worst description of of his book that I that I can give, but um, I think that Ken Wilber would actually appreciate being kind of hard to define. Thank you, I, I like that. And it's, the infinite game is an interesting concept. It's like the infinite mountain. So I'm hearing that trend, the the, the argument that happens and never goes away, a consistent argument. Do you drink coffee? How do you drink your coffee? If so, I'm really this this really should be the the controversial hot take. I have in my life been such an optimizer that there was a certain point where I just did a cost benefit analysis. And I was like, hey, coffee takes time, coffee stains your teeth. Why don't I just take caffeine pills? And so that's what I do. I, I wake up, I have like a little list of, of things that I do. I, I, I pour water because I want to hydrate and I just take a caffeine pill out of sight, out of mind. 
Wow. How many milligrams of caffeine? I think those are 200 okay. milligrams. It's like maybe three and a half cups, three, three ish cups, maybe three yeah. strong cups, two and a yeah. half strong cups. Yeah. And, and like, you know, depending on how I'm feeling, you can like pop these suckers open and like just pour half of it out. Like you can, you can kind of dose control it. I assume it's really controversial because I've never heard of anyone else doing it. The second I thought about it, I was like, why not? I think I, I literally asked ChatGPT. I was like, is there anything, is there anything wrong with this? Like, is this going to, you know, am I going to metabolize this in a way that's like bad for my kidneys? Like, why does no one do this? And I think it's, I think it, it has the, uh, I think it has the spirit of like Soylent. <laughs> I think it just takes the soul out of something that people really like for, for more than just its functional purpose. And that's one of the things about being kind of a maximizer is, I mean, I'm constantly looking for ways to cut corners and usually the only one that judges me is the one that lives with me. And I've gotten, I've gotten completely immune to weird questions and weird stares. Coming soon, Indie Hackers branded caffeine pills. To create <laughs> in the merch store, they go to store. I actually want to come back and finish with that. Building the media company or the media empire, reaching founders, inspiring them, even helping them with that starter journey. And there are so many parts to starting a company and then growing it too. Figuring out the idea, talking to customers, starting your LLC, C Corp, EINs, bank accounts, trademarks, getting energized, getting yourself in state, the workstation, how you work. All of it sometimes can sound so overwhelming that you think, why? What's the point? So let's assume you're in. You have that deck of cards. Let's call it the uh, diamonds. And you're like, hey, I, I want to go build. So you're in there. It's going to resonate. But there's this massive list of things and that you have to get started and do to finish. What What is the piece of advice you would give to someone mm. who's not going after the Elon Musk moonshot, but like you're actually trying to start and do this, like as tactical as you can get. Not that there's a formula or playbook, or maybe you'd say there is. Sure. But what What would you tell that person? Like, what would you tell them to do? Yeah, yeah. I the most generic because this is the the whole point here is put the person in front of me. Let me know what their specific situation is. There are all these different steps, and depending on what that situation is, I'm sure I'd have a different set of advice. But if I know nothing else, I have the exact same piece of advice. You always, always, always want to follow. I think Sean Purry, uh, my first million podcast, said this, and I've I've shamelessly uh, uh, co-opted it a million times is you want to always know your ABZs. So you want to know where you are. And where you are might be, shit, I'm at the beginning of running a business and I've got seven different things that I have to figure out. And I don't know which one of those I want to get, get to first. That's where your A is. And then you should know your Z. You should know, okay, I don't know exactly the order of operations I should follow, but I need to know where I want to go. So that's like, what's your vision? Do you want to do you want to have a service company that's making a certain amount of money a month? Do you want a certain amount of financial freedom? Do you want like, you know, are you already running a particular SaaS company? And you just know that like these three systems inside of your business are on fire and broken. And you want to get to a point where you're making a certain amount a month, you know where your Z is and where your A is, and then you just figure out the next step. And it can be any of these fires, but it's just the next step. And you don't worry about the C through Y. You don't worry about the rest of it. You just do this. And if you do that iteratively over and over again, very naturally, you will gain a little bit more perspective into the steps that are in front of you. But you just won't take on this cognitive load that human brains are not meant to handle. Like it is impossibly complex. And the big unlock is to realize for people that are new that people like me, people like you probably aren't sitting there mentally juggling every possible contingency and all of these things. So it's just to know your A, know the Z, and then know the B, and then F everything else. I love that. And I, I lied because now we reached this summit and it opened up another questionnaire. So <laughs> we talked about, I guess, generic, hey, starting maybe the zero to one or A to B. So let's say we're at B. I, I need to read one more thing. I, I saw you say, to go from zero to one as a founder, you have to learn how to wear all the hats. But to go from one to two, or let's say one to N, yep. you have to learn how to take them off. So let's say they, they listened to your advice. They did that. They got their ABZs down. They're at B now. They, they got something going. Could be one customer, could be 10, could be 10K per month. What does it mean to take all the hats off and go one to two? This is exactly developmental stage theory. This is the, this is the exact point. The things that you need to do to go from zero to one, whatever that means with a business, or frankly, whatever that means with any difficult pursuit, is you... I mean, let's say you gain a bunch of skills. You learn how to build a, an MVP prototype of your product. You learn how to do a little bit of marketing. You learn how to kind of launch, et cetera. But then now you have a lot of customers coming in. Now you're essentially overextended. But you have a set of, a set of skills and a set of habits, which are like, I, Channing, do all the things. But the thing that got you to this place is not the thing that's going to get you further 
to another place. Typically, I mean, you know, classically in a business, that means you're going to need to hire. You're going to need to learn how to be a manager. You're going to need to learn any number of things that typically have to do with essentially leveraging the fact that you now have extra capital, you have money, you have skills, experience, exposure to customers, you know, you have marketing. These are forms of, of capital, frankly, that you need to, to trade up into the next things that you can leverage. And that's something that a lot of people get stuck in, and especially people who identify themselves as being indie hackers. So if you're a, a VC-funded Whatever, you know, if you if you're kind of in the tribe of people that want to become billionaire tech founders, probably the first thing you think is, I just can't wait to have a ton of staff, right? And so that's something that they're thinking about early. But if you want to become a little tech founder, probably the thing that the people that you've idolized are like someone who's a solo founder making a lot of money and they have a bunch of bots doing their work. But then a lot of people get stuck. They get to the summit and they don't know how to climb up because they're like, well, this got me to the dance. I'm just going to keep doing the same thing. So taking the hats off, I guess that is a metaphor for hiring. It's a metaphor for managing. It's a metaphor for asking for help and not just being this person who figures everything out on your own. It's just a metaphor for trading up the capital that you've acquired to get to one to get to whatever end stage you want to get to next. I love that. And I'm I'm lying again. I have one more question I want to ask you <laughs> is I can just tell you've learned a lot. Like the reading, you're learning and learning and implying to yourself different businesses, learning from others too. I heard you taught yourself to code. And then I heard you're a pretty good writer. You learned how to write novels or you are writing a novel. Right. One, is that true too? How did you learn to do both of those two things, which might be incredibly diametrically opposed, like on either end of the spectrum? So one, is that true? And then how did you learn to do each of those? Do you have a, do you have a hack or a way you learn things? It's not. So A, it's true. Um, B, I mean, my, my first mountain was going to be that I was going to become a novelist. Um, I'm an English major. I didn't go to, my brother went to MIT and he was doing the Bill Gates thing and I just wanted to read books and write them. In fact, I finished a manuscript, got, a, uh, got represented by my dream literary agent and began to shop around the manuscript literally right before we started Indie Hackers and then sold it to Stripe and I put all of that on hold. So for me, that was just one mountain that I climbed. Obviously, I had to figure out how to do it. And then, and then the coding thing was just so that I could like pay rent in San Francisco because even if I became a best-selling New York Times novelist, I, I would still not be able to pay my way in any city that I want to live in. Um, so how do I do these things? I'm going to feel like I, I'm going si to sound like a broken record and that I really genuinely just think that the key to life is this dialectic of progress. It's, it's to get good at anything, you have to first get bad at it. So I'm a self-taught software engineer, but that's a little bit of a, there's a bit of a mythology to it. Like whether I was self-taught or whether I like went to school, I would have to suffer through being ignorant, having things that I didn't know, and then using the resources around me or within me to gain little milestones of progress. I think that if you end up teaching yourself things more often, the only real difference is that you just have a little bit more pain tolerance and you have a little bit more of a desire to do those things. And it just so happens that certain pursuits are pursuits where there's no blazed trail for you. Like there's no school that you can go to to learn how to be an entrepreneur. If you want to be an entrepreneur, you probably should do the opposite of getting like a business degree because they're going to teach you how to get installed in a large corporation and to like count check boxes. And obviously, if you want to write a story or you want to do any kind of art, because that's what writing a novel is, like there's no formula for it. So I think I just had the, the fortune or the misfortune of having dreams where there's no beaten path to those dreams. And I just, I'm a glutton for punishment. I, I love it. This was awesome. I know a ton of this is going to resonate. Some of it might not, but that's okay. Different cards in life, different suites. Thank you so much for coming on. And um, I can't wait to see the growth of Indie Hackers. And... I actually might go have to try some caffeine pills after, and we'll see if, the, if Indie Hackers launches yeah. that too. But thanks so much for coming on, man. Awesome. Thanks for inviting me.